In this presentation, we will review the main vital signs, why they are important, and how to take them. The important vital signs that you need to know include the body temperature, the pulse rate, the rate of breathing or the respiration rate, and we almost always check the blood pressure as well, even though it is not considered a vital sign. And one other condition that you should monitor if you have it available would be the blood oxygen level. It is important that you know why you are taking vital signs. Vital signs are measurements of the body's most basic function, and if they can change according to the individual's age, their sex, their weight, their exercise ability, and in general, their overall health will change the vital signs. They are very useful in detecting or monitoring over time certain medical problems and can catch other problems before they worsen. Vital signs can be measured anywhere, in a medical setting, at home, at the site of an emergency, or anywhere you have the proper equipment. These vital signs help healthcare providers to understand how well the body is functioning over time and if any changes need to be made to the patient's care. They alert them if there are any major new concerns that now need to be followed up on because there is a major change in vital signs. The first vital sign we will discuss is the body temperature. The body temperature is the amount of heat present in the body, and there are four ways you can take these. Rectally, through the forehead or temporal, orally, through the mouth, and via the ears, called tympanic. Generally, for children under three months to three years, it is best to take the temperature through a rectal or a forehead thermometer. From age four to senior citizens, it is generally best to take it orally or a tympanic ear thermometer. To get a baseline, you should find out what the temperature is for each person when they feel well, and that is their normal. Typically then, you will measure the body time temperature anytime you feel the skin is hotter than usual, or if they just don't feel well but you should always be sure there has been no hot or cold food intake within 15 minutes prior to using an oral thermometer because that will change the temperature reading. To determine a normal body temperature, it is always best to take it when they are feeling well and that will give you a good baseline. Anything above the average or normal temperature in the different age groups is considered a fever. This chart just gives you a general overview of the different ranges of temperature that you can have, whether it's taken orally, ear, or by the armpit. You'll notice that the armpit temperatures are generally about a degree lower than the oral. Measurements can be in either Fahrenheit or Celsius. If you notice a fever, especially a high fever greater than 101, you should always inform a healthcare provider to evaluate for the underlying reasons. There are many different ways to check the body's temperature. The most common now is probably the digital multi-use thermometer. It can be used in the mouth, in the rectum, or under the arm. It is very important when you have a thermometer to make sure it's labeled so that you use it the same way each time. The temporal artery thermometer is placed against the forehead and it can pick up the heat from the temporal artery which runs across the forehead. A tympanic or ear thermometer is inserted into the ear canal and it records the heat from the eardrum. There are now also remote or no contact thermometers that can measure body temperature without touching the skin. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions for the appropriate distance to hold that in front of the forehead. Two types of thermometers you should not use any longer. The glass mercury thermometers can break and be dangerous to your health because of the mercury that needs to be disposed of properly. 
The temperature strips are not always as accurate and generally are not recommended and they are usually placed on the forehead to measure the skin on the forehead. The procedure to take a body temperature includes starting with washing your hands with soap and water. Of course, the procedure will depend on the method and the type of thermometer you're using, but generally the results are obtained in less than a minute. First, you should always clean the thermometer with soap and water or rubbing alcohol before and after you use it. But be sure to use only cool or warm water to wash any thermometer. The extreme temperatures can damage the thermometer and give an incorrect reading. The steps to using an oral thermometer are pretty straightforward. After you have cleaned it and washed your hand, you can label it so that it is used in the mouth only. It is important though, if the patient is unable to close their mouth for any reason, do not use the oral thermometer. You should always wait the 15 minutes after any food intake to make sure that it does not change the temperature. Turn it on, put your disposable cover on it, and place it under the tongue towards the back of the mouth. Hold the thermometer in place until it beeps. When you take it out, you may read the temperature and record it. If needed, you should repeat. Using a tympanic thermometer or an ear thermometer, it quickly measures the temperature of the eardrum, which kind of reflects the body's core temperature. However, you do not want to use this method if there is any ear pain, any discharge coming from the ear, or even a lot of earwax. You will turn it on, put the disposable cover on, place it gently but securely into the opening of the ear canal. Hold it in place until it beeps and then record the temperature. Always with any abnormal reading or elevated or very low reading, it's best to repeat it to verify the correct reading. To use a temporal thermometer or forehead thermometer, you would tur first turn it on and if it's one that requires contact, you will place the flat end in the center of the forehead. Press and hold the scan button and move it slightly across your forehead until it reaches the hairline on one side of the head. By maintaining contact of the skin, you are following the temporal artery. When the thermometer reaches the hairline, release the scan button and remove the thermometer from your head. Read the temperature and record it. For the contactless thermometer, you simply point it towards the center of the forehead at the proper distance, according to the manufacturer's instructions. When using a rectal thermometer, it is always important to make sure it is labeled as a rectal thermometer so that it is never used in the mouth orally. Place a small amount of petroleum jelly on the end and turn the patient on their side and have the knees folded up to the chest. Turning the thermometer on, you will gently insert it one half to one inch into the rectum. You do not need to put it in any farther than that and always stop if you meet any resistance at all. Hold it in place until it beeps, take it out, read the temperature and record it. And as always, if there are any abnormal readings, you may repeat this to verify your measurement. The axillary temperature or underarm temperature is the least reliable method to use. You should only use it as a screening tool or when no other method is obtainable. Again, you will turn the thermometer on, making sure the underarm is dry. Lift the arm and place the end of the thermometer against the center of the armpit lower the arm and hold it firmly closed over the thermometer against the side. Keep the thermometer in place until it beeps. Then you can take it out, read the temperature and record it. The second vital sign we will discuss is the pulse rate or the heart rate. It is a vital sign that refers to the number of times the heart beats per minute 
and can give a good overall indication of the individual's health. Many things affect the pulse rate. Activity levels, medications taken, and the age all affect the resting pulse rate. The pulse can fluctuate very commonly with exercise, illness, injury, and even emotions. You can see here that the infant can have a resting pulse rate up to a high of 180, whereas anyone 10 and older, the average normal rate is 60 to 100. But what's interesting is athletes who are in good cardiovascular condition their resting heart rate can be as low as 40, 40 to 60 being an athlete's heart rate normal range. To obtain a pulse rate, there are different areas you can check to feel the pulse. It can be found on the side of the neck, on the carotids, the inside of the elbow or the brachial, or at the wrist, the radial artery. The wrist is generally the easiest for most to use. If you do use the carotid or lower neck arteries, be sure to not press too hard and never press on both sides of the neck at the same time as you will prevent blood flow to the brain. When taking a pulse, you should use your first and second fingertips, pressing firmly but gently on the arteries until you feel the pulse. Using a clock with a second hand, Begin counting the pulse for 60 seconds, or conversely, you can count it for 15 seconds and then multiply that number by four to calculate the beats per minute. It is generally best that when you're counting, do not watch the clock continuously, but concentrate on the beats of the pulse. Remember pressing too hard on some pulses, you can actually obliterate it. So a gentle but firm pressure is generally all you need. There can be a wide variety in pulse rates. Higher pulse rates can be considered normal for some, but it generally, if it's more than 20 beats per minute over the baseline, it is considered a high rate. Heart rates over 100 especially can be concerning. So it is always best to know what the baseline is from your prior checks. Slow pulse rates are generally at the rate is less than 60 beats per minute. And again, as I said, they can be normal for those who are athletic or in good physical condition. However, especially for like senior citizens, it can be concerning for some individuals as it can affect their physical activity levels and it, it may even lead to fainting episodes if the heart rate is too slow. So therefore, any pulse rate that is 20 beats per minute lower than the normal baseline is considered a low rate. Always take note of what the previous pulse rates have been, and if they are elevated or much slower than the normal baseline, contact the doctor. The third vital sign is called the respiratory rate or the breath rate. It is the number of breaths a person takes per minute. It is measured when the person is at rest, and all you do is count the number of breaths for one minute by counting how many times the chest rises. Many times, the patient will know you are counting their breaths, and it makes them breathe irregularly. So try to do this when you're taking other vital signs or without them being aware that you are counting. When checking the respirations, it is also very important to know whether this person is having any difficulty breathing. An increase in respiratory rate can be due to illness, fever, pain, or many underlying medical conditions. The normal healthy adult generally breathes 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Infants breathe faster 30 to 60, and children 6 to 12 can be 18 to 30 breaths per minute. One additional health monitoring measurement you can take is the oximetry or the blood oxygen level if you have an oximeter. Although it's not considered a vital sign, it is very valuable to determine how well the lungs are working. Place the oximeter on the finger, press start. Generally, the readout is digital and it will give both a pulse rate and a blood oxygen rate. 
Normal levels are usually 95 to 100 percent. However, with some lung diseases like COPD, normal can be anything over 90 percent. Values under 90 percent are considered low and generally it involves receiving extra oxygen so that we can bring it back up to above 90 percent. The next body measurement we will discuss is the blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force of the blood pushing against the artery walls during the contraction and relaxation of the heart. So every time the heart beats, it pumps blood into the arteries, and that results the highest blood pressure reading as the heart contracts. When the heart relaxes, the blood pressure falls. So the top, first, or systolic number is the pressure in your arteries during a heartbeat. The bottom, second, or diastolic number is the pressure in your arteries when your heart's resting to prepare for the next beat. An aneroid monitor has a dial gauge, like a compass face, and that measures blood pressure. A digital monitor is more popular as it is automatic and the reading can be easily read on the screen. There are a few key elements you need to know when you're preparing to take a blood pressure. For the best measurements, the person should be sitting quietly for three to five minutes beforehand in a comfortable position, preferably with the feet flat on the floor and the arms supported at heart height. Be sure they have used the bathroom prior to a blood pressure measurement as the bladder distension actually can cause changes in the blood pressure reading. The patient should not talk during the procedure as that also can cause deviations in the reading. Take the arm with the palm up and place the cuff on the bare upper arm above the bend of the elbow. Do not take the measurement over any type of clothing. The blood pressure cuff should be wrapped snugly around the arm, just enough space underneath to slide two fingers. The center of the cuff bladder should be placed over the brachial artery with the tubing on the cuff on the top of the arm. A cuff that fits around the upper arm will give a more accurate reading than one worn around the calf, the wrist, or the finger. However, they will all give blood pressure measurements. The most common error in using a cuff is that they use the inappropriate size. Too small of a cuff will result in elevated readings and too large or too loose will result in lower than normal readings. If you're using a digital blood pressure machine and you have it in place, all you will need to do is press start and wait for it to completely deflate and finish before you move or talk. You will get the reading on the screen when it is completed. For a manual blood pressure, you will need a stethoscope placed over the brachial artery. You will then close the air valve and squeeze the bulb quickly to inflate the cuff, watching the gauge until the cuff is inflated to at least 30 millimeters of mercury above the prior blood pressure reading or above the point at which the radial pulse disappears. Slowly open the air valve to deflate the cuff watching the gauge until you can hear the return of the pulse. This number will be the systolic reading. Continue to listen as you deflate the cuff and note when the pulse disappears or it changes significantly and this will be the diastolic or bottom number reading. You will note that you get different blood pressure readings at many different times of the day Many factors contribute to the measurements, including physical activity, your emotional state, your body position, whether you have to go to the bathroom, the temperature of the room, your diet, especially a high salt or alcohol intake will elevate the readings. Background noises, sleep deprivation, and even the time of day can change the blood pressure readings. When you are doing a blood pressure, ideally to get the most accurate measurement, Three readings should be taken at least one minute apart and the average of the three blood pressure readings recorded. So in summary, 
Many different factors contribute to different vital sign measurements, so be sure you are always taking them at the optimal time and with the proper method. Always check to see what the prior or baseline measurements are for each person because everyone can have a different set of normal. If there is any significant change from the baseline readings, whether it's your temperature, your pulse rate, breathing, or oximetry, it is always best to check it again, and if it remains persistently elevated or lower, let the healthcare provider know. Thank you for listening.